Chapter 7 Piacer e Papuan vol la sua stagion Italian Proverb Mr. Kasabin, as might be expected, spent a great deal of his time at the Grange in these weeks, and the hindrance which courtship occasioned to the progress of his great work, the key to all mythologies, naturally made him look forward the more eagerly to the happy termination of courtship. But he had deliberately incurred the hindrance, having made up his mind that it was now time for him to adorn his life with the graces of female companionship, to irradiate the gloom which fatigue was apt to hang over the intervals of studious labor with the play of female fancy, and to secure in this, his culminating age, the solace of female tendance for his declining years. Hence, he determined to abandon himself to the stream of feeling, and perhaps was surprised to find what an exceedingly shallow rill it was. As Andrade Regent's baptism by immersion could only be performed symbolically, Mr. Kasabin found that sprinkling was the utmost approach to a plunge which his stream would afford him, and he concluded that the poets had much exaggerated the force of masculine passion. Nevertheless, he observed with pleasure that Miss Brooke showed an ardent submissive affection which promised to fulfill his most agreeable previsions of marriage. It had once or twice crossed his mind that possibly there was some deficiency in Dorothea to account for the moderation of his abandonment, but he was unable to discern the deficiency, or to figure to himself a woman who would have pleased him better, so that there was clearly no reason to fall back upon but the exaggerations of human tradition. "'Could I not be preparing myself now to be more useful?' said Dorothea to him, one morning, early in the time of courtship, could I not learn to read Latin and Greek aloud to you, as Milton's daughters did to their father, without understanding what they read? I fear that would be wearisome to you, said Mr. Kasabin, smiling, and, indeed, if I remember rightly, the young women you have mentioned regarded that exercise in unknown tongues as a ground for rebellion against the poet. Yes, but in the first place they were very naughty girls, else they would have been proud to minister to such a father, and in the second place they might have studied privately and taught themselves to understand what they read, and then it would have been interesting. I hope you don't expect me to be naughty and stupid? I expect you to be all that an exquisite young lady can be in every possible relation of life. Certainly it might be a great advantage if you were able to copy the Greek character, and to that end it were well to begin with a little reading. Dorothea seized this as a precious permission. She would not have asked Mr. Kasabin at once to teach her the languages, dreading of all things to be tiresome instead of helpful, but it was not entirely out of devotion to her future husband that she wished to know Latin and Greek. Those provinces of masculine knowledge seemed to her a standing ground from which all truth could be seen more truly. As it was, she constantly doubted her own conclusions, because she felt her own ignorance. How could she be confident that one-roomed cottages were not for the glory of God, when men who knew the classics appeared to conciliate indifference to the cottages with zeal for the glory? Perhaps even Hebrew might be necessary, at least the alphabet and a few roots, in order to arrive at the core of things and judge soundly on the social duties of the Christian. And she had not reached that point of renunciation at which she would have been satisfied with having a wise husband, she wished, poor child, to be wise herself. Miss Brooke was certainly very naive with all her alleged cleverness. Celia, whose mind had never been thought too powerful, saw the emptiness of other people's pretensions much more readily. To have in general but little feeling seems to be the only security against feeling too much on any particular occasion. However, Mr. Kasabin consented to listen and teach for an hour together, like a schoolmaster of little boys, or rather like a lover, to whom a mistress's elementary ignorance and difficulties have a touching fitness. Few scholars would have disliked teaching the alphabet under such circumstances. But Dorothea herself was a little shocked and discouraged at her own stupidity, and the answers she got to some timid questions about the value of the Greek accents gave her a painful suspicion that here indeed there might be secrets not capable of explanation to a woman's reason. Mr. Brooke had no doubt on that point, and expressed himself with his usual strength upon it one day that he came into the library while the reading was going forward. Well, but now, Kasabin, such deep studies, classics, mathematics, that kind of thing, are too taxing for a woman, too taxing, you know. Dorothea is learning to read the characters simply, said Mr. Kasabin, evading the question. She had the very considerate thought of saving my eyes. 
Ah, uh, well, without understanding, you know, that may not be so bad. But there is a lightness about the feminine mind, a touch and go, music, the fine arts, that kind of thing, they should study those up to a certain point, women should, but in a light way, you know. A woman should be able to sit down and play you or sing you a good old English tune. That is what I like, though I have heard most things, been at the opera in Vienna, Gluck, Mozart, everything of that sort. But I'm a conservative in music, it's not like ideas, you know. I stick to the good old tunes. Mr. Kasabin is not fond of the piano, and I am very glad he is not, said Dorothea, whose slight regard for domestic music and feminine fine art must be forgiven her, considering the small tinkling and smearing in which they chiefly consisted at that dark period. She smiled and looked up at her betrothed with grateful eyes. If he had always been asking her to play the last rose of summer, she would have required much resignation. He says there is only an old harpsichord at Lowick, and it is covered with books. Ah, there you are behind Celia, my dear. Celia, now, plays very prettily, and is always ready to play. However, since Kasabin does not like it, you are all right. But it's a pity you should not have little recreations of that sort, Kasabin, the bow always strung, that kind of thing, you know, will not do. I never could look on it in the light of a recreation to have my ears teased with measured noises, said Mr. Kasabin. A tune much iterated has the ridiculous effect of making the words in my mind perform a sort of minuet to keep time, an effect hardly tolerable, I imagine, after boyhood. As to the grander forms of music, worthy to accompany solemn celebrations, and even to serve as an educating influence according to the ancient conception, I say nothing, for with these we are not immediately concerned. No, but music of that sort I should enjoy, said Dorothea. When we were coming home from Lausanne, my uncle took us to hear the great organ at Freiburg, and it made me sob. That kind of thing is not healthy, my dear, said Mr. Brooke. Kasabin, she will be in your hands now. You must teach my niece to take things more quietly, eh, Dorothea? He ended with a smile, not wishing to hurt his niece, but really thinking that it was perhaps better for her to be early married to so sober a fellow as Kasabin, since she would not hear of Chetam. It is wonderful, though, he said to himself as he shuffled out of the room, it is wonderful that she should have liked him. However, the match is good. I should have been traveling out of my brief to have hindered it, let Mrs. Cadwallader say what she will. He is pretty certain to be a bishop, is Kasabin. That was a very seasonable pamphlet of his on the Catholic question, a deanery at least. They owe him a deanery. And here I must vindicate a claim to philosophical reflectiveness by remarking that Mr. Brooke on this occasion little thought of the radical speech which, at a later period, he was led to make on the incomes of the bishops. What elegant historian would neglect a striking opportunity for pointing out that his heroes did not foresee the history of the world, or even their own actions, for example, that Henry of Navarre, when a Protestant baby, little thought of being a Catholic monarch, or that Alfred the Great, when he measured his laborious nights with burning candles, had no idea of future gentlemen measuring their idle days with watches. Here is a mine of truth, which, however vigorously it may be worked, is likely to outlast our coal. But of Mr. Brooke I make a further remark perhaps less warranted by precedent, namely, that if he had foreknown his speech, it might not have made any great difference. To think with pleasure of his niece's husband having a large ecclesiastical income was one thing, to make a liberal speech was another thing, and it is a narrow mind which cannot look at a subject from various points of view.